So as I've said before, one of the main focuses of this channel was for me to get to learn new things about different martial arts. When you break down the words, martial means military, so we're talking about military arts. And in military, we're talking about combat. Combat arts leading to combat sports. One of the most fascinating to me has always been the art of fencing. I've always found it very intriguing how the sword as a tool is used as an extension of the body in the art. And what most of us know about fencing has to do with what's done on the grand stage of the Olympics. Then I've learned that there's a difference between Olympic sport fencing and classical and traditional fencing. And I wanted to do an analysis and learn more about this. What better way to do it than to call up and have an interview with one of the premier fencing maestros in the world, Maestro Ramon Martinez. Take a listen. And as always, guys, thanks for joining Team Shrugs. All right, Team Shrugs, we are back with the legendary maestro, Ramon Martinez. How are you, sir? I'm very good. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as I Hello. said, as I said in my intro to this video, um, a main focus for me in going ahead and creating this channel, it was bifold. The first focus was for me to learn new things about martial arts that I didn't know before. Um, and then the second focus was for me to give some of my opinions, whether they be popular or unpopular, about the state of affairs in martial arts as a whole and combat sports today. I've always had a fascination with fencing. I think many people do, but they don't really know much about fencing. And their perception of fencing is all based on what they see on their television screens once every four years uh, for the Olympics. So I do want to touch base with you on that. But if you could briefly just give us a little history on yourself in the art. Well, myself, I started when I was uh, 18, 18 or 19. I've been doing this now for 47 years. I've been um, a master for uh, 25 of those. Uh, I, and uh, this has become my way of life. I started out, actually, I wanted to be an actor, but I took a fencing class when I was in college, which I, and I got hooked. I said I gave up acting, I gave up everything, I'm not, and uh, I concentrated mostly on that. You know, I have, I've had other jobs and things like that, but uh, uh, for, for the past 30-some-odd years, I've been devoted. This is all I do. I've, I've been around the world, and I've taught all over. All over. Uh, I was lucky enough to learn from an old German master who was in, not in the sport tradition, but in the martial arts tradition, which I, I'll, I'll explain more, more in depth on that later. So he uh, was the last of the classical masters, and he was in New York for decades, and uh, very strict, old school German, and uh, I was the only one that had enough stamina <laughs> to deal with him and became his protege. And shortly before he died, he passed that, he, he transmitted his title to me. And it's, it's been uh, ever since, you know, I've been going at it ever since. I have, I have taught all over the place. I've, 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 I've done some teaching of, uh, in, in, the, in the modern arena, but I, I did not like it. And because it, it, the, the two roles is just they they uh, they counterindicated to each other. Just they, they just don't match the different purpose. And uh, I just gave that up. And uh, I did that for a very short time, less than two years. Uh, but I just you know con considered to teach always the uh, the classical, traditional, and some of the historical forms as well. And now my understanding is that there's there's three major schools of of classical fencing. If, am I correct that there's French, Spanish, and Italian. Well, there's in in the classical era, it was it was the always the rivalry was, was between the Italian schools, which was there were more than one, and the French school. Okay. Uh, the, the, Sp the Spanish school and the other schools, you know, so to speak, uh, the Spanish school especially is a derivative. It's a hybrid form of the two, which mm. didn't really catch on that much, because in Spain in the in the nineteenth century, uh, the French school predominated. And what happened was that the French school came into Spain and became Hispanicized. Oh. The Spanish school, the old Spanish school, was still in existence. 
it continued in existence for a long time. Yeah, but that's what happened. People, a lot of people think that the, uh, uh, that the, that the Spanish school became Frenchified. The opposite. The French school became Spanishized. Understood. So those, those are the two. Main, the two main schools are French and Italian in the nineteenth century. What are the and What are the major a lot of rivalries? And yeah, what are the major major differences in them from a technique perspective, from French to Italian? Well, the the French school could not exist without the Italian school. In fact, it, it emerged from the Italian school, and that was in the mid seventeenth century, and it, and it, and it, uh, it developed from there. Uh, the Italian school uh, is older, in fact. In fact, there's more, there's more than one Italian school. There's the Bolognese school, there's the Roman school, there's the Florentine school, there's the, the, the Sicilian school, and several of them. There's, there's family systems also. You have the uh, Greco system, you have the Florio, it, it goes on and on. Mm. Um, but uh, the French school was always unified pretty much, uh, you know, and uh, take that with a grain of salt. When, we say, when I say unified, as compared to Italy, it was very unified because Italy was not a country. It was, this, it was, it was a collection of regions and, and feudal states that stayed together. It didn't become a country until Victor Emmanuel in the back of, in the, uh, I think it was mid-19th century. I don't remember the right. exact dates. So they're, they're all slightly different. Uh, we have, the main differences in the Italian school, we have these, uh, Scuola Siciliana, the Sicilian school, right? And then you have Scuola Napolitana, the Neapolitan school, which are both considered southern. And then you have uh, the Scuola Settentroniale, which is uh, mid, mid to northern, and it does have some French influence. And that, that's, it's known for that. But uh, as of late, through some of my studies, I've, I've become to have some doubts, but that's another story. Mm. The, the French school is pretty much dominant, uh, 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 the same, uh, beginning from mid to late 18th, and mid to late 18th, 16th, excuse me, mid to late 17th century onward. And uh, that's pretty much it. What's it? The, the French school was developed because of the emergence of what is called the small sword. And it's sort of like, well, who what came first, the chicken or the egg? We, uh, this, this right. speculation is, did the small sword develop because of the technique, or did the technique could develop because of the small sword? No one has a definitive answer, and I can tell you I've looked. Really, I think that that the, that the uh, that, that the school emerged first because the, one of the first thing they uh, they the French did was they they were holding the weapon different because the Italian weapon is basically a smaller type of uh, cup hilt rapier, and the cup hilt rapier evolved in Spain. And no one has an exact date of, of, from where or when that came. I think the earliest uh, depiction of that is a picture of a uh, painting of Philip IV wearing a, wearing a cup hilt rapier. And I forget what museum or library that's in. Uh, at the moment, it just escapes me. But uh, I have a copy of that painting around here somewhere. Hmm. From the layman's perspective, what a lot of us see when we are talking about fencing, um, I, I think most people see two things. They see, uh, as we discussed, the Olympic uh, sport or game of fencing. There's a lot of jumping around and 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 um, light touches and swinging a sword very, very, very broadly around with very wild types of movements. And then there's also what we see as far as Hollywood sword fighting, Things like The Princess Bride come to mind or the Three Musketeers movies where, again, it's this very big, grandiose stuff. I've posted um, a highlight reel from some of the Olympic fencing. I believe it was the 2012 Olympics, but I'm not quite sure. I believe that was London 2012. Mm -hmm. And it shows some highlights of that. And there's a lot of dancing around and acrobatic jumping and things. Um, and for comparison's sake, I've posted a brief video um, from you, your school's YouTube channel, and mm -hmm. it was a northern Italian fencing demonstration, which looks like a much more precise art with much smaller, much more intricate movements coming straight from the wrist for point control. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if maybe you could shed some light on the differences, the things we see from Hollywood to olympic art slash games to the actual practical art because i think the things that people know are people fence they fight with swords and they slap each other in the face and say you know um we're, we're going to have a duel mm -hmm. right well the, the, the well let, let's, uh, let's let's divide this up let's start out with the with, with the movie stuff movie sure. stage fencing 
So movie and, and, and stage fencing is, is, is creating an illusion. The techniques that they use, you know, are, are, are huge so that the camera can pick it up and, and, and the, the guy in the back row can see it. Now, even that went through an evolution because in, in, the, in the early days of, uh, you know, of stage fencing, they, they, they actually used to hire a fencing master to teach the actors how to, how to really fence. And, they, and the fencing master would choreograph all the fights. Some were better than others. I, you know, that, that can be broken down also, but some were better than others. But it was part of the actor's training to learn how to fence. Uh, some were good, some were terrible, <laughs> to, be, to be frank. Right. Uh, and the, yeah, the master would create these choreographies based on you know, an exchange of phrases, which is a, uh, uh, a technical t uh, term for a, an exchange of, of different, of, uh, different uh, uh, actions, either defensive or offensive, between two, two defenders. They would choreograph and they would learn it like a dance. And, and like I said, in the, in the early days, fencing masters choreographed that. And that, that continued into the movies, into the, into the silent movies. You have movies like, uh, uh, for instance, some of the ones that have the better uh, sword technique are uh, the Black Pirate with Douglas Fairbanks uh, and uh, the Black Pirate, uh, the Man in the Iron Mask, the Three Musketeers, things like that. And uh, so, so again, some were better than others. But my favorite of those is, is the silent one, the, the, uh, the Black Pirate, where they show rape and dagger. And my late fencing master was an assistant on that on that movie, hmm. and, and he trained several of the, of the old movies movie actors like uh, Charlie Chaplin, that was very like a couple of others. I, I the names escape me. So that practice of using fencing masters continued well into the sound era, in 19, uh, 1930s, 1940, 1950s, up to the 60s. They were using fencing masters, and the actors get trained. I had an, uh, an old friend of mine. I'm not going to mention his name, but he was a, a, a on the contract with 20th Century Fox back in the 1940s, and he told me that when they would hire you, you would have to report to work every day, whether or not you were in a movie. So they would, in, in those days where you would train, they would, they would train you how to fence, how to box, how to sing, how to dance, how to ride a horse. You were always working right. for, for, for your next job. But anyway, in 1940s, it was uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the best of the choreographies, I think, in all in all history was an old one called the 1940 Mark of Zorro with Tyron Power and Basil Rathbone. And those two gentlemen knew how to fence. I mean, they weren't high-level competitors, but they knew how to fence, so they, they looked great. It was well choreographed. And Tyron Power was doubled by the fencing master's son, who was a fencing master in his own life. But anyway, oh. that continued into the 1970s, and then you had these uh, uh, associations of fight directors developed, and these three people were not fencing masters, these were people who learned uh, this artificial form of, of fencing, which the idea is to embellish these actions and make them as elaborate and, and as uh, um, flamboyant as possible. Not so much in the, in, in, in the, in the pre-60s era, but in, in the 1970s forward. So they have, there's several societies worldwide and they, and they specialize in creating the illusion, right? Uh, anybody that has any knowledge of combat we look at these choreographies, and some of them are frankly laughable. Mm. But that's okay because this is for entertainment purposes, right? And it's fun as long as it tells the story. One of my one of my good friends is is, is doing that. This is for a long time. He's one of the best. I know two people one in Australia, one here in the states who are very good. Anyway, so let's put that aside for a while. Right. But remember, the important thing remember: stage combat, movie combat, is to create an illusion and tell the story. It doesn't have to be realistic. Understood. Okay. Now, Olympic fencing, the sport fencing, uh, fencing uh, was included in the first modern Olympic Games in 1896, and it was included as as, as part of that. Um, but it didn't really become officially a sport until uh, circa 1913, 1914, with the Federación Internacional de Esgrim, the FIE. Mm -hmm. was formed to, to govern all of that sport. And then you had the different associations. Each country had their own fencing association. And what happened was, in the late, uh, in, in the late 19th century, right, uh, they, were, they had, and into the 20th century, they, they had professional fencing. Masters would compete against each other in, in these elaborate tournaments for big money. Hmm. 
uh, and they were big names. Uh, and uh, but then after when the when the uh, after the war, then when the, when the uh, amateur associations uh, uh, emerged, it became more of the amateur sport. And to make a long story short, I can get into a lot of detail, which we don't have time for today. But uh, fencing is now regulated by the uh, the, the FIE, and and uh, in, in the United States, you have the United States Fencing Association. It's all amateur. It's all amateur sport. Now I say sport. Sport fencing is not the goal. Of sport fencing is not to save your life. Right. The sport fencing, the sport fencing is to score points in a very technical, elaborate game, and uh, so it, 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 you know that that follows a certain set of strict rules. And you know, the, uh, I can get into when when the blades were electrified and all that, but that's that's another story. So fencing became this elaborate, highly regulated sport, and it's a specialized. Uh, uh, game. I hesitate to call it a combat sport because the sport is more than the combat. Understood. Uh, the, uh, now, not to put these 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 modern fencers down. These people are tremendous athletes. Right. I mean, I mean, real. So they, they do marvelous things, you know, with, with the, the power of their legs and their training. These guys are athletes. But fencing was not designed for athletes. It was designed, it was the purpose of fencing was it was for the everyday man to be able to defend himself. So, for instance, in the game of fencing, uh, you uh, as a fencer, let's say you and I were fencing, we're both modern fencers. We can take risks in doing things and get away with it that no sane duelist would take because it would be frankly suicidal. Right. You know the the. Uh, the average is that you, even if you hit the other person, you're going to buy the farm too. You see, so uh, classical fencing, historical fencing, classical, or what I like to call traditional fencing, is based on the duel. Okay? The idea is to not to win a duel because you don't win or lose a duel, you survive it. That's my fencing master told me. That's the last place on earth you want to be. Right. And if somebody's pointing a sharp object at your face and he's, he, he's only six or seven feet away. And the slightest miscalculation or inattention on your part can cause you serious injury or death. You tend to be as conser very conservative. Right. Right. Um, there was a very there was a very famous uh, fencer back in the nineteenth century. His name was uh, the Baron Cesar de Besancourt. He says that a, a sharp point is a preemptive fact that makes short work of illusion. Mm. So no matter how good you are or who you think you are, there's always a risk of getting killed. So. Uh, or, or seriously hurt. So, a duel is a very nasty, irrational thing to be involved in because if you can't solve your problems using logic and speaking to each other like human beings, if you, then if you resort to violence to make your point, and by the way, that's where that term comes from, make your make point. Make your point, fencing. Something ah. went seriously, yes, yes, something went seriously wrong somewhere. For sure. So, you know, uh, for sure. So uh, when you get to that place, the duel, the dueling ground, uh, it's a very grim, nasty business. And now we, in, in historical accounts, we hear of the most sensational duels where something went horribly wrong. But the duels that were conducted privately, you don't hear about because they were clandestine illegal affairs. And a lot of preparation went into it. And the dueling codes, by the way, change from century to century, from country to country. So it's it, it's it's quite elaborate. But this dueling business is supposed to be how two gentlemen settle something, leaving it up to an act of God that said that God decided the right. And that comes from the medieval era. Right. Um, that's where that comes from. But it's highly illegal. In the medieval era, they had trial by combat, and that was sanctioned. Mm. Let's say if you and I had a problem, we'd go to the local to, to the local duke or the king and ask for permission to have it out in in a closed field. I forget what there's a French term for that. I forget what it was, what it is. And it, they would settle this. They would set up this elaborate closed field, and, and you would have have that armed encounter in front of an entire populace, your 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 peers in front of the king. And that's the way it would go. That is a trial by combat. A lot of people say that's a, that they call that a duel. It's not a duel. A duel is illegal. 
Understood. Wow. Okay. So, it, so anyway, uh, getting getting back to the uh, to the difference between sport. To simply put it, sport fencing is a highly technical, complex game. Like it's like chess. Back to places they call it. I think in France they call it animated chess. Oh. Uh, a duel is a grim business, and it is there is no second chance. It's, it's, it's over when it's over. And by the way, one of the other misconceptions that people have is duels are always to the death. Not so. The purpose of a duel is to show responsibility that you as an individual are, uh, will back up your word to the death if, next, if necessary and your honor and your personal integrity. That's what that's for. Mm. The purpose out there is that you, you, uh, you represent it. Understood. Right. Right. And the other person said, well, I'm just as good as you are. Let's, let's, let's have it out. But a duel is not total mayhem. A duel is a controlled environment. It's run by five, five officials. And the doctor has to be on, on, on standby right there. By the way, the doctor could lose his license. Right, because so be the whole affair is illegal to begin with. Correct. Right. And, and a lot of times, if it was reported to the police, the police would show up late. Oh, okay. And because turn that blind eye. Judges and <laughs> politicians were involved in, in these clandestine affairs. Uh, I hope that clears it up a little bit. Sure but, does. I, I, I can go ad nauseum for us for hours on this, but uh, it, 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 would, it would, I think it would bore your audience. So now in your, in your estimation, the things that you're seeing uh, in sport or Olympic fencing, right? We talk about whether or not we're saying that it's a game, it's for scoring, they're taking more risks. And as we've said, they're, they are they are great athletes, but oh, yeah, in, without question. but in the technique practiced, are we seeing things that would save their lives at any point? I would say no. And I'll tell you why, because. The word fencing, right? That comes from an old word, schedule. Okay. It means to shield. That word is found in each of the evolutions of the word schedule, right? If you go to Old Provencal, it's, you know, they call fencing escarvis, which, by the way, that's where the term skirmish comes from, oh. right? You have in Italian, scherma, which means to protect, to shield. Right. Escrim in French and esgrima in Spanish are all delivered, uh, uh, derivatives of that first word, scarabo, is Latin. So that's the art of defense. Now, the reason I say that the Olympic Frenchers will probably die using those techniques in a real combative encounter is because they emphasize offense because that's how you score points. Right. So they're, they're, their activity is based on muscular strength and speed. And they pay very little attention, in my opinion, to the defense. They defend themselves by backing away, which only makes the, the attacker accelerate his attack. Okay. And there's, there's other factors, too. If, if, you know, if you want me to get into it more technically later. but So that, that's why I think they would die. The, uh, the uh, traditional classical fencing is... Highly conservative for good reason. Hmm. Us, because you're in a situation that's as serious as a heart attack. Right, right. Us hand-to-hand -hand martial artists look at things like fencing. And when we break it down pragmatically, I even titled portions of this video this, we talk about, when I look at it, I see the sword itself as an extension of the body in the art and the way it's practiced. And it makes sense in referring to it that way. And when I look at things that I'm seeing on the Olympic stage, it does not look like the sword has anything to do with the rest of the body. Does that make sense? You know, I, I, yeah, it makes absolutely sense. But, but you, 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 you focus on something that, that uh, and thank you for reminding me that I wanted to mention. They are trying to make uh, uh, their body move faster than this weapon that's very light in their hand. So that doesn't make much sense. I think it would make more sense to make the weapon move efficiently 
and conservatively because it's smaller and easier to handle comparatively speaking like do these gross body actions that put you at risk right like for instance some of the, some of these olympic frenchers when they attack they bring their arm back and they're point up thus they're not they're no longer really in a position of threatening the adversary and that was a good uh, person that really knows his time and knows how to use his uh, uh his timing uh, he could be hit before he finishes that aggressive action before his, uh, his arm is is uh is, is fully extended right so that's that's important too. so let's see they they're they're, they're 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 making up i think for a, 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 an extensive training of their hand because they don't have time for them. Most, most Olympic punches come from colleges and things like that. They don't have time to develop their hands. I mean, that's using the proliferation of orthopedic grips and everywhere because they don't have time to develop it. Mm. Seldom do you see the use of the, of the, of the uh, classical grips anymore, like the classical French or the classical Italian grips anymore, or a heel touch, let's say. Right. So I think, I think you're, you're onto something right there. I uh, just did a, an interview uh, prior to this one with uh, Master Jerry Fasby Fontanez, who uh, actually got me into the world of martial arts at age four um, and mm -hmm. taught me most of what I know. Um, and uh, it's something that we always discussed, and I can't help but think about that when discussing things like this, is that the best block in the world, the best block has always been not being there. And it seems like that principle follows through in all martial arts because, again, we're just we're discussing fencing and we're talking about being very defensively minded because there's no room for error. And you, you just don't want to be at the end of that point. Mm -hmm. Right? If, if, and this is something that uh, so you said the best kind of block or, or defensive action is not to be there. Now, that has to do with distance. Right. And that's one of the major tenets of not only fencing but all martial arts. Right? There's a thing called I call it universal fencing theory, and it, and it's and it's it's very simple on the surface, but it isn't when you get deep, deeper into it because it's all based on time, distance, and proportion. Time is when, distance is from when. The proportion of the relative size of any action that you do, right? So if something requires a small action and you do a big one, it's wrong. If something requires a big action and a small one, and you do a small one, it's still wrong. But right. that has to be done in the right distance. So a, a, a fighter that can control the distance in that is an extremely dangerous person because he's always in control. Understood. So arguably, uh, so you have to control, again, the time, the distance, and the weapon, yours and the, and the other person's. So arguably, for this fist, feet, a blade, that all applies. So it really is a, a, a universal martial arts theory. And one of the people that I, I admire a lot is Bruce Lee, because he was very well aware of that. And he studied fencing. And he used some of the theory and some of the, the technical applications coming from fencing in his Jeet Kune Do. How do I know that? I read the book and I had a long conversation with Dayo Santo. And he, 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 he told me, in fact, that Bruce Lee told him before he went to Hong Kong, he said, you'll never be a complete martial artist until you learn how to fence. And he meant French foil. Because he uses the terminology in his work. Anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I love, I love that. I love that. I'd like, to, I'd like to know a little bit more about some of the people you looked, looked up to even growing up as it relates to combat sports, different boxers, different martial artists, people you saw on screens, people you got to see live and in person. Who really looked, yeah. who did you look up to and, and, and really get you as involved as it is that you are now a lifetime, lifelong dedicated to the martial arts. It is your life. It, it, it's, it's, it's my life. It's been that way, you know, um, since I was 19. So it's, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, growing up as a kid, I used to watch the fights with my dad. Every Friday night, they had Friday night fights. And I saw a lot of fighters. I saw Sugar Ray Robinson, I saw Hurricane Carter, I saw Archie Moore, I saw um, Avril Griffith, I saw uh, Benny Parrott, Rocky Graziano, uh, and, uh, and, this, and Sarah Floyd Patterson. I saw, I saw him. My favorite of those fighters of the day, I like Sugar Ray Robinson because I, he was so precise in everything that he did. And he had this sort of brace to him that I have not seen in any other fight. Not, I've seen it in other fight, but not to that extent, because he had this thing that sort of indescribable. And I forget what weight, what weight category he was. After that, I would say Muhammad Ali. 
I look at the way he moved, his mastery of distance and timing and proportion in the ring. I said, what a fencer he would have made. You know, uh, he was amazing. Uh, after that, I would I was uh, I saw him fight a few times in these early days. I liked him in the Mumada. It was Hector Macho Camacho. I liked him a lot. He had a very, very smooth, traditional boxing style. He had a very nice style about the way he, he, he boxed. Yeah. yeah. And the way he profiled his body, he moved like a fence. I said, no, I said this guy, yeah, he was, I thought he was great. So what I think is incredible... <laughs> What I think is incredible there, the, the point you're hitting home and you're hitting on there, is the carryover from art to art as far as martial arts are concerned. Because you're looking at boxers and seeing very similar techniques that would translate between boxing and fencing and vice versa. Fencing into boxing. Yeah. yeah. Back in the day, I think it was 17th or 18th century, it escapes at the moment, there was a, a fencing master, his name was James Fig. And he used to fight, and uh, he was a gladiator in, in, in that time period. He fought, he'd fight with swords, and, 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 but he was also a pugilist. And uh, he was fighting to well in his vast age. Like so this guy was a big guy, about well, well over six feet. And I consider him to be the first heavyweight champion of the world. Hmm. And uh, the first heavyweight champion of the world was a fencing master. Well, there you have it. And a professional fighter. Yeah. Mr. Martinez. Yeah. I know, I know that's, I know that's arguable, but again, it's my opinion. Take it for what it's worth. That's okay, Mr. Martinez. Uh, where can we find you guys? Where, where can we find, where can we find the school? Where, where can we go to find out more about you guys? What, what should we look for? Oh, the information is on, is online. Just, just look up Martinez Academy of Arms, and you'll find our, our, our website. You could also look up uh, on Facebook. Uh, we have a Facebook page. Okay. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. Go on YouTube, type in Martinez Academy of Arms. We have uh, a YouTube channel with uh, lots of videos and more, there's more coming. So, and you can subscribe to that so you don't have to miss anything. Uh, yeah. I want to thank you. I want to thank you so much for your time and, and taking the time out to clarify some things for us here today. Um, and uh, just taking the time out to speak with me. It's always a pleasure again to speak with you. Can you uh, give us a final thought? Your final thoughts on where where the world is at as far as the progression of martial arts and what we see coming to the future. Well, um, I can say a lot of things. I'm keep it simple. Right? We have uh, what, what's called mo mixed martial arts and modern mo modern martial arts. I don't I don't I don't like to say I, I don't consider them martial arts. I think I consider those modern combat forms. Traditional martial arts are now basically, how can I say this politely? <laughs> you don't have to. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to say okay. it politely. They, 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 they simply pushed aside as being ineffective, not applicable. Uh, but again, this, you have to see what is the purpose of your martial arts training? Do you want to be, excuse my language, a badass? Or do you want to be a better human being? Right? A better human being trains and he develops his mind, body, and spirit so that he doesn't have to fight. Yes, sir. A badass is always look, has a chip on his shoulder, this, this, the, the, you know, the, the size of, you know, of a battleship, you know, and that's not a good way to be. You know, and it, uh, traditional martial arts, you can practice for the rest of your life. These modern forms, they have a, a, a limited time span because you, you put the, they're putting their body through a lot of wear and tear that wouldn't happen with a traditional martial art because, again, it's, it's the idea is conservative. Um, I remember the uh, first thing you, you sent me that we looked at that videotape. Yeah, we're going to do that in a bit as well. Absolutely. Yeah, or, or, okay, I'll, I'll save my comments for, for, that, for, for, that, for that. But that's the state of affairs. We have a lot of... Uh, there are masters like myself, you know, and I, I, people call me maestro and I have the title, you know, uh, and, and I use it, but every time uh, somebody calls me that, my the hairs in the back of my neck stand up because I'm not even close to the level my old was. I, I, I aspire to that. And I tell my students all the time, you know, I don't want you to be as good as me. I want you to be better than me in everything. Yes, sir. So martial arts again. You you, you, you want to you want to be a sportsman or you want to be a better human being, okay? So that's 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 the way I look at it. You know, and I've been fortunate. Yeah, I've been exposed to both worlds, and I, I I'd rather be a better human being. Understood, uh, sir. Was, 
there was a Spanish fencing master in the late 16th century. He's the father of the Sp of La Verdadera Destreza, of the Spanish school. He said that his book, he wrote a treatise back in the day, it's called the, uh, uh, on, on Christian Offense and Defense, because he was a knight and the commander of the Holy Order of Christ. So he, he said that uh, the sword is a divine weapon, because all animals have their own form of, 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 of defense, claws, teeth, hoof. Man is helpless. So they said the sword is a divine weapon that's given to you for protection, right? You 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 uh, you understand that uh, the, uh, as a as a trained swordsman, you have the ability to kill, but you don't have to. And that is important because you can defeat an aggressive adversary if you're that good, and that's if you have to train by disarming them or inflicting us the least damage possible because if you deliberately decide to kill someone that's murder and that's that's against god's law but self-defense that's another story yes sir yeah again maestro thank you so much for your time and uh thanks You're welcome. we uh we will we will put up links for all of your guys things so everyone can find you guys and as always thank you for joining team shrugs take care guys uh -oh.